Welcome back, everyone. We are live for another week of Growing With My Fellow Growers. I'm your host, Jack Greenstock, joined as always by an amazing panel. And I will pass it over first to Matthew Gates. Yeah, hey, everyone. I know that we always get a bunch of people who come back week to week, but um, uh, I am Matthew Gates. For those who don't know, I will be talking at the Potent Ponics uh, second annual aquaponics presentation that's coming up uh, this week. And I'm actually still working on uh, bits and parts of that presentation. Uh, so if you're interested in learning about cannabis pests, I will be talking about them there. Uh, you can also find my other content on Xenthanol, the YouTube channel, as well as on my website, xenthanol.com, and on my Instagram at SyncAngel and at and also on Twitter at SyncAngel. Yes. Looking forward to the uh, Potent Ponics event and always great to have you back. Normally, I passed it over first to Spartan Grown, who just got here with us. I think you can probably hear me at this point because I can see him. So I'll pass it over to Spartan Grown. Welcome back. So, guys, sorry, I couldn't get my Instagram loaded on my computer, so I couldn't get on Zoom. I had to actually manually type in all the numbers, but I got in. Um, but yeah, I'm Spartan Grown. You can find me on Instagram, <laughs> all one word, Spartan Grown, or you can shoot me an email at spartangrown at gmail.com. Uh, I can answer questions on either organic or synthetic growing. Happy to have you back, as always, and uh, sorry that you had to go through the manual typing out the uh, link there. Uh, if you want to DM me in the future, I'll, maybe I'll just add you to the list because I email uh, Brandon um, Matthew, so maybe I could just add you to the list of the people that I emailed the link to, so maybe it'd be a well, little easier for you to open on here. If that happens again, maybe. This is the first time ever, so. <laughs> All right, cool. No worries, then. <laughs> uh, with that said, I'll pass it over next to Kyle Breeder. Welcome back. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, yeah, Kyle Breeder here. Uh, before I start, I just want to say thank you to everybody that was involved in the seed drop on the 29th. Uh, things went really well. Everyone should have their packages by now. I just want to appreciate all the support and all the love from you guys. Uh, it means a lot to me. Uh, but yeah, if you're looking for anything uh, in regards to information or pictures from me, it's pure breeding now, not predicated breeding. Uh, my website is uh, it's pbreeding.com, but I'm actually changing. Um, I'm having a second domain that's going to link to the same place. It's going to be pure dash breeding. So that, that's, that's going to be a thing soon. I'm actually getting my whole website redone as of right now. Um, but yeah, glad to be here. I'm glad everyone's safe and it's good to see everyone. Glad to have you back. Next up, Dr. MJ. Hey guys. Yeah, Dr. MJ Coco from CocoForCannabis.com. I am excited to be back. I kind of like slept through the show last week, so I'm happy to be back for this show and um, looking forward to a good one, Jack. Thanks. I actually slept through it as well because I was uh, traveling and jet lagged and had a long weekend. So uh, happy that we're both back this week and uh, pass it next over to Brandon Rust. What's going on, everybody? Brandon Rust here. For anybody who don't, uh, who's not familiar with me, you can find a body of my work on Instagram at rust, R-U-S-T dot Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N. You can also find a link to my company, Bokashi Earthworks and Black Label Organics in the bio there. Yeah, it's good to be back. I uh, missed last week. I've been really busy and lots of stuff going on as usual. So always fun to be here, to talk to you guys, take questions, tell people about growing weed. All good stuff. Glad to have you back. And last and certainly not least, the American one. Jack, it's great to have you and everybody else back. It was, uh, it was a great show last week, but it was um, definitely you all were missed. And uh, shout out to everyone in chat and everyone that hit me up uh, in the DMs for the uh, to check out the Amy Aces. I'm the American one on YouTube and the American one underscore on, with underscore eight keens on the IG. And yeah, most of you know where find me and i'm always around so uh yeah excellent to be here happy to have you back i know the last few weeks i was teasing i was getting ready to chop getting ready to chop and finally had my harvest of amy aces ran it through the herbs now for uh, i think it's like four and a half days and uh then let it sit in there for a little bit after jarred it up and uh finally now having some smoke of it and uh it's pretty strong stuff i'm a fan definitely it was a pretty good yielder and it's very very strong aroma i mean from mid flower on, it just blew right through the carbon filter and uh, strong like citrus smells. I think you mentioned uh, some of the people found grapefruit. I would say like lemon, lime, uh, probably more on like the lemon side, but definitely a mix of citrus and uh, 
has some gassiness to it and definitely the rubber um like i think you said like new shoe or something like a blue tent yeah. blue blue uh like handball rubber blue handball yeah and uh definitely get some of that and some i'm not good enough with the different cheeses to know like exactly what cheese it smells like but there's faint right. smells of cheese the one thing that really surprised me uh vaporizing it was there's a subtle really 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 subtle like all the other flavors that i just uh mentioned come through in the smell and also in the taste but the thing that kind of surprised me was there's like a hint of banana flavor just kind of snuck it in there somehow so but with that said it's extremely potent both my wife and i are pretty uh, heavy daily users of both edibles concentrate and a whole bunch of other stuff and for us to get you know sat down by some flour right? is uh, always a good sign so sometimes Excellent. it's just because it's the new stuff but i've been yeah. trying it all week long and it's definitely still getting me there and i'm uh, very very happy with it so thank you again I'm, for those seeds I'm glad and, to hear that yeah and yeah, it's it's really pine saw. I think a lot of people could, told, told me pine saw too on the on the uh, on the smell by the end of it all. But yeah, it is really varying, and there's a lot of different things that come out sometimes. So yeah, I'm glad your guys are enjoying it. And yeah, I'm glad. I love I love the high off of that, and it's mother too. So yeah, it's all good. I'd say it's like one of those. Uh, sometimes we get into the indica sativa hybrid whatever paradigm. I'd say it you feel it very strongly in your head and your body, which is nice. Like you get the full body, like tingly, good sensations. And uh, I don't know, it's just, it definitely hits you fast and very hard. So uh, anybody out there who's hasn't grown it yet, I know a few people are DMing me like, yo, I'm growing it right now. All excited for it. And other people are just harvesting it. So it's cool to see the community uh, giving it the love and respect that it deserves. Cause I'd say it's some really fire shit. So uh, hats off to you. <laughs> it's nice to be able to plug your buddy's products and uh, you know, seeds and everything like that. So especially when you've personally gotten to try them. So committed the time and uh, I definitely think it was worth it. So thanks again. Well, th to the American one. Yeah. Thanks for uh, respecting it enough to try give it a shot. And yeah, I'm glad a lot of people are uh, on IG are really making it look good too, man. So <laughs> it's really good. It's really awesome to see it. I'm sure everybody who puts out seeds, when you see if someone growing them, you're just like, it's always great to see that shit. Yeah, it was uh, cool because you grew out some of the Velvet Punch, Spartan grew out some of it, and it's uh, awesome to see it in everybody else's garden. Uh, it can be a little bit different, or even just seeing like how uh, similar it can be is, is fascinating. And uh, seeing people have success with it is mainly the exciting thing, and people telling you that it's good and they're happy with it. And that's what this community is all about, is uh, sharing the love and the seeds and everything like that. So it's cool to see Kyle have a successful drop. I don't know, are you sold out yet, Kyle, or are you still uh, got some stock over there? uh this the slush is basically sold out uh the hindu rupiah was definitely like the prize winner i mean i sold uh, a, a lot of those um but i have enough stock of the luckily weirdly the hindu rupiah also produced the most seed so i i do have some hindu rupiah left and i do have a bunch of uh well not a bunch but a, a good bit of uh decent bit of new england hazy kush and what i'm doing right now is <clears throat> i spent the weekend uh basically pre-packing a bunch of them three and five packs because i have my own booth at the Harvest Cup in Worcester. Um, so that's pretty exciting. I've never been to a trade show. I've never been to any of those things. So it's my first one, I'm by myself. So hopefully it goes well. <laughs> I have a feeling it will. Um, from what I've seen at the guys in Michigan when they set up their you know, booths and tents and things like that, it might be the first time, but like guys like, you know, we all learn from each other, right? You have a basic understanding of what it is and you've got an online community that follows you. And uh, I think that the mass community is very strong. So I, I hope that they have a great right. turnout and that people will be interested in your stuff. You've got great photos uh, documenting your stuff. It's not like you're a fly by night breeder. You've been doing this for a few years now and you can stand behind your products and your seeds. So uh, people have been growing them for a long time. I've watched and uh, seen people grow it out. So it's uh, amazing just to see everybody continue to uh, have success and the community all kind of growing in their own different directions. Like I think it's kind of like an art and it's cool to see so many different people taking it so many different directions. I know some people get upset when new breeders enter the game. They think it should just be this pure thing and everybody should have years and years of dedicated time spent, whatever. But I think there are some people that pick it up really quickly. And uh, no matter how long you've been doing it for, I think it's cool to see people uh, dabbling and, and making new creations and people out there having tons of uh, fun with it. So it's just awesome, you know, seeing this panel uh, evolve and grow. And uh, I'm very thankful to have, breeders on the panel and just growers on the panel this is a i'm happy to be back you can tell it's i missed a week and i'm just like man it's great to be here with such awesome fucking people so thank you guys again for coming back i haven't even really looked over at the chat too much yet uh, i see people doing i was spartan doing a little dab action over there with the emojis one uh, thing i want to jump out uh, i want to talk about uh 
Gate, if you don't mind, uh, Gatekeeper in chat said, uh, "Hope you're good, dude. Fuck the MCMA." So I'd like to give a little update on. on yeah, give us a little update on that, Spartan. So on, um, <clears throat> and I agree. First, the first foremost, fuck the MCMA. But uh, <laughs> so here in the Michigan Thursday, I, they had a lobby day. Um, there was a few organizations that uh, organized, um, and what we had was like it was like Michigan Normal, um, the uh, eh. It's just hard to remember all these acronyms. It's like M I C I A, which is another industry group. So they're a, they're a, I guess you would say, alternate to the MCMA. They they represent businesses in the uh, industry. They represent over three hundred businesses in the industry, but uh, they voted unanimously in not supporting this bill which was very nice to have because that was like a poker chip for me during the day because i was going around talking to lawmakers and for me to be able to say point to this paperwork and say look you see who's who's helping us on this lobby day today it's the micia it's another industry group the cannabis industry who is against this bill so the industry is telling you it's bad the caregivers are telling you it's bad. The patients are telling you it's bad. <laughs> the only people that's telling you it's good is the MCMA. So that was really strong, but they opened up their offices for us. That's where we, we met and that's where we organized from. Um, Rick Thompson and Jamie Lowell were there, activists from here in the state. A bunch of people were there. I, I don't, I don't want to sit there and name because I'm going to miss people. I don't want to do that. But um, what we did was, was they pre, uh, they pre um, organized meetings with lawmakers and um then what they did was everybody that showed up they split you up into teams and they had you go to a different meeting well the republicans decided or they had heard about it or whatever but they decided they were going to move everything up two hours to change all the schedules and moved everything up two hours so most not all most of the republican lawmakers canceled their meetings because they now had to be on the floor, house floor, during the scheduled meetings with us. Um, so everybody shows up and a lot of the meetings are canceled. We get split into groups. The groups are assigned the meetings that are still being honored. And then there's obviously people there that are left open. I was one of those people because of canceled meetings. So then they just gave us all, they split the extra people into groups. I was in a group with a, a lady, her name was Stacy. Shout out to you, Stacy, if you're watching. And um, we, we, they just gave us a list of names to basically hunt down, you know, hunt these guys down, <laughs> you know, talk to these people. Um, the list that we got were people that didn't respond to wanting a meeting or not. So I told them, I said, give me the hardest ones. And so uh, we were talking mostly to Republicans for the day. Um, we were even even at one point went into the Capitol building to wait for them to maybe walk out of the floor, off the floor to uh, kind of not so much ambush, but to, you know, talk to them there to be able to get a word in there. Um, but most of the work was done in their office building where we went. I just was going door to door. I went and found my rep. Uh, I just went door to door, just every, every office that I could get in that was open. We just walked in. And if the, lawmaker wasn't there their staff was there and we could educate them and that's like the that's the next best thing because those are the people they work with every single day and they have their ear and that's what we did we just you know plied our case and it, it, it went actually very well we're very receptive we actually talked to one of the people who was on the list the bill sponsor uh clements he was actually stacy chased his ass down honestly uh, I, I wasn't going to run after any lawmaker because I'm not about to get shot. So I, I just refused to do that. <laughs> but she was running her ass. She caught him. We were outside on the street uh, talking to his bill sponsor, for God's sake. So that was cool. Um, but I mean, long story short, that there was just a lot of education that wasn't that they just didn't have. Um, and so I quickly developed a plan when we walked into these meetings or had these conversations with people was I'm, I'm not convincing anything. I'm just sitting there to educate them. And that's how I presented myself. I'm like, look, I'm a cannabis educator. I do this, you know, eight hours a day or eight hours a week on my free time. I work in the industry. I was a caregiver. 
do you have any questions? <laughs> Just start it out like that. And that'll get them talking. And there wasn't this whole combative nature, you know, there's no egos and, and we could actually get somewhere. And it, that really, really was awesome for me to just sit there and do what I do every day online. It's just sit there, talk and answer questions and uh, just get the truth out there. And then, you know, I would slip in reasons why the bill was bad. You know, when they're answering questions, you know, I'd answer their question and I would say, hmm, how does this relate to the bill? And how can I twist this to let them know why I think it's the bill is bad? And there was a million reasons that I could do it. it. It was so easy to just fit it in into a regular conversation. And I left every single meeting uh, feeling pretty good. In fact, one of the meetings I left now, usually with a politician, you can never get a straight answer. So don't get your hopes up when you're going into a meeting and trying to get a definite answer from anybody. So I got a lot of maybes, but I didn't get any no's. And I got one actual definite yes. When I left one building, there was one representative who I will leave your name out of it for now until I see how you vote. But I did get a promise when I left the building with a handshake that uh, that was a no vote. We only need 28 vote, 29 no votes. So I was happy that I secured one or helped to secure one. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I was feeling good about it. And everything I'm hearing is that they had, they're not voting on it. They're not voting on it. So the longer this gets pushed, the better because speed is how they get these bullshit bills through. So every time it gets pushed back, that means they don't think they have the vote. Now I heard it from, let me just say a reliable source that there was a whip count. And what that means is basically a whip is just think of them as a, uh, a senior, like a senior person in the party, like Republican party, Democratic party. And they'll go around when they're thinking about getting something up for a vote, they'll kind of go around and get a pre-vote to see if they think they have enough votes to go ahead and pull it in. Cause you don't want to put a, put up the vote. If you don't have enough, to, you don't want it to fail. And rumor is we need, well, we need 29. That's not a rumor. We need 29, no votes, 28 or 29, no votes. And uh, the rumor is we had 35. So that's really good news. And that was before lobby day. So <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, man. That's good news. Yeah. yeah good what work. is an example Sorry. of like a question that they would have asked you and then um because i have a few ideas in my head but i'm i'm sure that you remember at least one or two and then like uh maybe a response and, and how you enlightened them on to why the policy was bad and would hurt the caregivers and in, in michigan generally so here's a really good one it was a tough question too and it was from my own representative staff and um his question was, was because I brought up the fact that these bills are touted or they're being sold to lawmakers as in the name of it is the safe, the cannabis safety act. It's all about safety. And they're saying they're achieving that safety by requiring the new license holders to be tested. The new license holders will be a subsection of caregivers that will be allowed to grow more than what the new caregiver limits would be. So it's going to be a small percentage of the caregivers as it is that would be tested. Now, my representative's question to me was, or what I said to them was, I can't remember. No, he, what his question was, he said, I said, so, you know, they're touting it as a safety act, but the patients right now, they have the ability right now, without the laws being changed, to walk into any shop and buy tested commercial weed. And they're choosing not to buy that because they're getting a better medicine, they feel, outside of that. And what my representative shot back to me was, well, why can't we test their, their weed? And I said to them, we absolutely can test their weed. And in fact, they do get, it does get tested. It's just not reported through metric. You can call right now, if you'd like to, PSI Labs in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and ask them as a representative of the, <laughs> of the state, hey, I'm wondering how many tests do you have done that are not in metric? Just that, you don't have to have specific names or anything like that, just do you do any testing outside of metric testing for cannabis in Michigan? And they're gonna tell you, absolutely. I said, because when I was a caregiver, I was getting my things tested and I know other care caregivers that have their things tested. So I know that it's happening. And he was surprised that that was even happening, one. And then two, I said, but I don't know that I would want to 
make a law to say that all caregivers should have their stuff tested because one, history is already behind us. Since 2008, these laws have been legal and have not required testing. And we have had zero epidemics or anything, any incidences of, you know, mass poisonings or whatever you think would happen, you know, pesticide, whatever it is, we haven't had that cases that we would have heard about it by now since 2008. So there's one big one. <laughs> and then all of man's history of, of no deaths, you know, but, and then, and then two is the cost of testing right now. If you mandate testing, you're mandating a business, somebody having to use a business that's going to profit off of patients. That's what you would be doing. And, um, you know, you can have a caregiver, you can say that because he, he immediately said, well, we could, we wouldn't have the patients pay it. We could have the caregivers pay it. And I said, and then what is the caregiver going to have to do? He's, he's going to increase his cost to produce that same product, which would increase the cost of the end product. That's just how that works. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, so that conversation, it, like I said, it wasn't a, a easy situation. It wasn't an easy conversation by any means. But uh, I still think that's common sense. And I still think there's middle ground we could we could find for sure. Um, and, and that was another strategy I used. Um, we got a lot of comments as we were going through. Well, thank you for being respectful or other caregivers aren't so respectful or aren't so don't, you know, carry themselves as well as you guys. Um, so. I do want to stress to people, you know, when you're dealing with lawmakers, you have to realize those are human beings. You're, you're talking to another human being. And if you come at them all hard and aggressive, the human instinct is just a shutdown and defense, defense, defense. And they're not even listening to you at that point. So please don't get aggressive. And because honestly, in my experience, 99% of the people I talk to I think beyond the bill sponsor, 99% of the people that I talked to were totally cool people, totally fine. They weren't out to kill people or anything like that. They just were ignorant. They were completely ignorant of the situation, completely ignorant of, of the plant and how it grows and the medicine of it and even the laws. So let's just open up a conversation, you know, be respectful. That's the, that's the thing that really got us far, apparently, because it was mentioned several, several times. And, uh, you know, just, just tell them the truth. It's just like, if you look at these bills, they, they, they do all the work for you. You can just say, look, this right here says we can't make any sort of medicine other than smoked medicine. How can you tell a patient with a lung disease that they have to smoke something? It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> There's just, I mean, that's one tiny example that I could go on and on and on about. And that's what made, they made it so easy for me because even when they bumped it from the committee to the house and they changed, they changed it and made it even worse for the patients, which makes it even easier to expose. And then we had a, um, the organizers organized a, uh, a, a dinner on Thursday, I think, no, Tuesday, the ninth, Tuesday night. And it's just for lawmakers. It's an informational. It's not, it's going to just talk about cannabis and it's going to talk about, you know, this is how can't you grow cannabis? This is what you would expect to get from a harvest from cannabis. And, you know, all of the basic stuff because they just don't have the knowledge. And we handed out, dude, I don't know how many fucking invitations to that. And I was super oh. impressed that uh, I've heard from Jamie Lowell that a lot, a lot of the RSVPs that are coming in are Republicans. So, yes, thank you very much, because that's all we need is just get the information out. Is there a deadline at all on this thing or can they just keep postponing it indefinitely? Not indefinitely. They can keep postponing it until the end of the current session. So that would be the next election is 22. So the end of next year. Okay. That's not too. Yeah. I also want to, I just want to like reemphasize what Spartan is saying here because uh, I've, um, I was speaking, this is not nearly as involved as, as, as he is very much. Thanks to you. I really appreciate that you're doing this. Uh, of course, there's other reasons as well. Um, that's just so important. But when I was speaking at a, a public commentary in San Diego County about, uh, you know, opening up cultivation even um, and, and other sorts of things, like just the county 
in San Diego can kind of, it can be kind of capricious. Sometimes it seems like they're very okay with cannabis and other times it seems like uh, they're very much not. Uh, and it's definitely constituents based, right? But um, I observed what you observed as well. Uh, people were very frustrated and they were taking out their frustrations on the people who were there to hear the, the public you know, uh, questions and comments about moving forward with that, that, uh, um, I don't know, I don't actually remember all the specifics of this one, this is more than a year ago, actually there were two examples and I, there were different, um, points, but, um, the most recent one that I went to, I remember coming back around after, um, uh, the County board, right. I think, I think I'm saying that right. They, uh, they had, they had left at that point, you know, the, the meeting was over, uh, and I, and I went to talk to them afterwards. And I could tell that they had been they had been kind of rattled from the experience because people were just so vitriolic. Um, and I'm not saying that like it's wrong to have this frustration, but it, it absolutely, like you say, Spartan, it does not endear people to your cause uh, to be that way. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, I when I spoke, I, I tried to keep it very basic towards um, you know, hey. If you, I even actually made it sort of an economic argument, I felt, and, uh, and I felt like kind of a, a good legislative one, which is that if you want, there are so many people in the public that consume it uh, here in San Diego and other parts of California, you know, so that's not going to stop. And as long as it's going to be accepted, you know, at the very least, if you're going to make the point that people should, uh, you know, with all these testing and everything, and you want people to buy from dispensaries and things like this you didn't, at the very least what you could do um is uh, uh is allow for it to go forward with um less regulation that makes it a burden on the people who are consuming it right because how are you sure. going to expect people how are you going to expect people to to comply um you know in that way you gotta you gotta reduce restrictions you gotta help you gotta make it so that people aren't being arrested for this for example you gotta do a bunch well, of other then, things like this as well. Another key, and I agree with you for sure there, but another key there is if you can follow up with a solution, you know, you're going with a problem, yes, but if you definitely. can follow up with a solution or an idea or at least a direction, that's so helpful to get the conversation to continue. Like even for myself, I was like, here's my name. Here's my number. I am available. You can email me. Do you have any questions about cannabis ever for any reason? You know what I mean? Keep this conversation, you know, please use me because the information you're getting is bogus information that is, <laughs> that is like filtered through how can we make money? You know, let's, let's get another opinion or you can listen to that one if you want to, but let's please use me for another opinion. Not let's not listen to one. Let's get multiple views on the table when we fucking are drafting laws for everyone to follow. Yeah, I think the point that I had made that was uh, kind of to that end was that, um, you know, San Diego is a big place, incredibly good uh, biotech and other sorts of and agriculture as well. Um, you know, massive uh, focal point for so many industries. Um, if you want us to be successful in the coming, you know, cannabis cultivation, super complex, then <laughs> you have, this is your opportunity to get in in the beginning. Right. Because ultimately you're going to probably, I didn't say it quite like this, but essentially you're going to capitulate. I feel eventually, eventually things are going to be more accepted. So would you, it's already happening. Rather, I'm sorry right, to cut you, you off. It's we're That's so true. far behind. How no, far behind right. are we from Santa Barbara where they have literal acres of greenhouses set up and Great. smashing? No, you're right. You're the people right. that have permits here all around San Diego, I'm involved with one of the farms. They're still going through red tape bullshit. And by the time that they even enter into the market, by the time their first crop hits the market, there's going to be people who have been doing it for literally years. Yes. So San Diego is <laughs> uh, far behind and, and far it's behind. A, a shame. But one of the things I wanted to go back to what Spartan was talking about earlier, um, he was mentioning just how being kind is so important, not only with just politicians. I know it's easy to like hate politicians. But just people in general, like whether you're at the gas station or the corner store or wherever, like these people deal with a lot of fucking people and usually don't get treated very well. And if you smell like cannabis and you come in and you're the fucking nice guy, they might change their opinion of cannabis. I see so much people saying like, 
oh, well, cannabis is better than alcohol or cannabis is better than tobacco. There's a lot of tobacco users and there's a lot of alcohol users out there who would support cannabis people if we stop shitting on everyone, just like be kind and stop being judgmental, even if that stuff is not as good or maybe more harmful or whatever you want to go on some diatribe about. A lot of those people would vote pro cannabis and are voting pro cannabis, even though they don't use it. So it's not like a us against them kind of thing. Being kind as a cannabis community and respectful is going to help us go so much further than being confrontational. Um, we just have to be smart and strategic. And those two things, I think, uh, treating people right will, will definitely help us all as a community more than probably anything else. So I wanted to just agree with Matthew and, and give Spartan the nod that that is a highly important thing that is often underestimated, I'd say. And just keep trying, especially when it comes to politics. You know what I mean? I went to a lot of offices and a lot of those doors were locked, <laughs> but you know what? There's a lot more doors to fucking grab a hold of. So just, you know, I, I, I honestly, how should I say it? You know, going there, my opinion of how I thought the day was going to go as opposed to how the day really went, I felt like it went way the fuck better. So don't let your own doubts, you know, though that could be your biggest enemy could keep you home to keep you from even taking that trip so just you know push your doubts aside and just try at least try one thing i also forgot to mention was uh when you get something named like the safety act always be really skeptical because politicians notoriously will name something super juicy and appealing like this is the you know safety for children act or whatever and, and then it just has so many other things tacked onto those bills so uh, when it sounds super nice and appealing like that it's one of the times that you should even be more critical. And like Spartan said, they're not necessarily bad people. They might not even know. So asking the questions and putting it in front of their face, you might make them confront things that they never even considered or realized were a problem or will become a problem when they sign this new law. And the big problem is typically when something gets signed into law, it's harder to get it out. And so oftentimes it gets there and then the MCMA would be successful, but you guys are challenging it and preventing it from happening, which is huge. Uh, you know, stopping it before it really starts and causes and damage to the community and limits resources and access. Yeah. And at the same time, it gets valuable information for the cause. You know what I mean? I can go back to the office, at the MC, MICIA offices and have conversations with, you know, influential people there and say, look, I'm here and, this is the biggest issue that they're having. You know, this is the biggest thing that they're seeing. So we need to figure out a solution for that. And then we can kill this bill, you know, simple things like that. You know what I mean? And, or just, Hey, I heard uh, this, this, and this, and I shot it down with this and it seemed to work really well. So if you hear this, use this same strategy and that really helps. It really does. It's, it's valuable. So even in, if you feel like you go into a meeting with your, Really, the best power, the most power an individual has, any person, is with their own representative. You can actually go to the Capitol, and if they're on the floor, you can fill out this fucking form and pull them off the fucking floor and have them talk to you. But uh, so, Do any of them smoke weed? Yeah, they fucking okay. do. That's cool. Is there, yeah. any, is there any state that actually, that actually fulfilled it or uh, that actually got the thing thrown out? Are we, is, or what's Say what? Is there any other states that have actually accomplished what you guys are trying to accomplish right now? I don't know, man. I would, it would take me, I don't have the attention span to keep up hardly with what's going on in my state, let alone everybody else's state. I'm sure Oklahoma kind of did with metric. They uh, pushed back yeah. Brandon earlier in the year. They metric is for those who don't know a basically it pairs with like point of sale systems. It's helping people do uh, seed to sale tracking in a lot of the legal states. I think it's in like 12 or more states at this point. But um, yeah. something they don't really talk about is there's like single use plastic tags that for every single plant, you have to use a metric tag. Then these farms end up getting literally like piles and mountains of these tags that are not allowed to be reused. And metric literally is extracting money from what could be taxes going to the state directly, which could be used to, you know, fix your roads or go to the schools and things that they actually want to happen um, end up happening less because companies like metric are trying to skim some money off the top. So it has happened in other states that the people pushed back against nonsensical legislation, I would say, and won. And I think it'll continue to happen. Um, California actually voted against legalizing several times because the first several pitches were monopolization and didn't offer home growing, things like that. So although we don't have a perfect policy now, at least everybody can grow their six. 
And um, we're, I think, all moving forward and, and trying to be as conscious politically as we can and keeping an eye on things so that we don't lose our rights or, uh, you know, have them change dramatically so that we can't enjoy what we're currently doing. But I think on the uh, swinging things back to the grow side, I saw a few questions earlier. Uh, and I'd have to scroll way back up, but one of them was about using Bavaria Bassiana. I don't know if Matthew saw that one. It was like talking about I'm Bavaria at it right now, close to actually. harvest. So we want to take that one. So the question from Gatekeeper88 says, um, man panel, when using things like Bavaria Bassiana, et cetera, do they need to be washed off at harvest or similar? Do things like that or... I'm going to say, I'm going to assume have a similar effect or uh, let's see, do things like that or similar effect oh, or similarly affect end product, I guess. Sorry about that. So um, not in my experience, that hasn't been a problem, um, at least for Bavaria Bastiana. You say et cetera, that could be uh, <laughs> a lot of different things. I think I have actually heard of people um, having trouble with um uh, bacillus sometimes but really i mean it, if we're talking from like a like from a commercial standpoint like feeling like a microbial um inoculant test or something like that uh, that's very different from like whether asking a question as to whether or not it is harmful or not so the the word need needs to be contextualized there see i sound like the politicians spartan is talking about it. <laughs> well i would question i would question you know you don't generally you're not generally spraying so your end product is flour, unless you're growing right. it, or it could be further down the line to be concentrates, but it's going to be some type of flour originally. You don't generally treat flour with any product like that. So it would have to have migrated if it can get there. This is a good question for you, Matthew. <laughs> but I mean, if you treat the leaves with, you know, Bavaria bassiana, I mean, is there a chance that it's going to really have any way to populate onto the actual through the trichomes and onto the plant material of the, of the actual bud itself? Not really. It's def like, it def when I talk about it having like an endophyte capacity or like an epiphyte capacity, it's usually in a context for it like being living tissue. And so I don't think, uh, I don't think it's impossible because it also exists in the soil and, and, and detritus and things like that. But I, I wouldn't expect it to be like, uh, like a powdery mildew or botrytis that like, it's really, really, you know, um, you know, just pop overpopulates like it wouldn't expect it to be a, a post-harvest pest essentially or, or have a staying like power right because like, yeah it has to be reapplied pretty much every four days while the plants are alive so i can imagine by the time your plants dried and cured the bavaria in my estimation be gone and uh i don't know i could be wrong in that assumption but i would think that people wouldn't be like spraying it on a harvest day onto their buds yeah. or anything yeah. like that but even if they had um I would imagine, and I've heard the same about certain things like some enzymes, like the amazing doctor's enzymes. Some people do spray up to harvest day and then they test the end product and they can't detect it. So I don't mm -hmm. know if it's just like a half-life thing being short enough or something like that. Well, it depends on what you apply, right? But like usually there's some sort of, um, like if you're not applying, like sometimes you got to be also careful with this. Sometimes you buy a product and, and it says like bacillus, whatever, or some sort of a microbe and you're like, oh, great, it's a microbe. But if you look at it quickly, uh, more, more like a suitly, you'll see that it's actually not the, the bacteria or whatever at all. It's some sort of a product that it produces. And maybe you have like dead microbial um, uh, bodies in there from like a heat treatment or something like that, like Burkholderia, I think it's a Burkholderia product that's like that. Um, but you know, so like, if you're, I can think of the only time or the time that would be like the worst would be like, if you were applying it, like you're saying, Jack, like, like on the, on the product post harvest at the very end. Um, and I wouldn't even expect then for it to like, like colonize the, the flower or anything in a really bad way, but at the same time, I wouldn't apply it in that context either. So. Not suggested for sure. We've got a few other really good questions. If you want to jump to, I think the two might be from both from Cheddar Bob regarding the beetles and then uh, mealybug destroyer predator. Yeah, so I did, I did take a look at that and I answered it in chat. Uh, but basically, if we're talking about Cryptolamus montrosary, the mealybug destroyer lady beetle, um, I actually just took a, a quick cursory search on Google because uh, I basically work in bug IT at this point. 
uh, <laughs> the Cornell University states that um, in this little diagram, which is taken from a research report, that uh, from like egg to like end of pupa, it's about 20, 20 days or so, um, it sounds like, and an adult can live for like uh, longer, like about 50 days as an adult. So you put those things together. But of course, this depends on the temperature. Uh, and they said this is about 27 degrees Celsius. So that's 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's about how long it'll, it'll last, which is pretty long. And speaking of personal experiences living in California, uh, we've applied this mealy bug destroyer for a long time um, for agricultural reasons, for like citrus mealy bug and grapevine mealy bug and things like this, which get on the cannabis too. Uh, but they've kind of naturalized at this point. Like there's so many mealy bug populations and ornamental and hor you know, and uh, agricultural trade that goes on that these mealy bugs get everywhere, so do the beetles and their wasps for that matter too. So, you know, they kind of last a long time and I feel like they're pretty robust and hardy, uh, at least in my uh, environment. That's good information to have. And I think it directly uh, answered that question. It's always nice to have it for the people that are only listening to the podcast after and don't get to see the live chat. Some of these questions that uh, we answer, I think it's valuable uh, knowledge that is shared. So another one being, they say, I have flower beetles, pretty good in my living soil. Doesn't seem to be damaging the plant. They seem, uh, their spelling seem like a, a seam of a pants, but um, to eat aphids, I have, should I worry? Um, can you say that last part again? So it said that they're, they have beetles. They didn't describe which kind, but it says that they seem to be eating the aphids that they have and it doesn't seem to be damaging the plant. Should they worry? Oh, I see. Well, I mean, that's awesome. Uh, in that case, you probably have a lady beetle or something like that. Um, you know, there are some insects out there that are omnivorous. They'll feed on their pests and then they'll like take a little bite or drink a little sap or something with the plant too. They exist out there, but um, it sounds like the predaceous feeding of a predator. Um, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. You can always send me a picture uh, if you have access to social media or something. I get tons of those questions and I like to help people out when I have the time for it. Hutch did that earlier. I was like, they asked what the best way to contact with a photo was. And I answered it kind of quickly. They sent a few photos of a bud. I was like, oh, it looks pretty good. It was frosty. And I was like, what's your question? And then a few photos later, I saw that there was like the little bud starting to form in like the petiole where the petiole meets the leaf. And uh, I've seen that a bunch of times before, but it must have been something that they'd seen for their first time. And maybe I should show it just for, uh, you know, good stream sake. Um, I did make yeah. the, the uh, screen sharing available to everyone. So I'm going to go over to my DMs and pull something up right now. Here we go. All righty. I'm going to hit share screen. Share. All right. Full screen. So this is from Hutch864. We got some frosty cool. buds here. And then you see here that little uh, starting to develop kind of where the stem meets oh, yeah. the leaf. A little bit of a bud action forming. And it's nothing to be alarmed. I've actually seen it a lot when there's kelp or a few other things. I think it's a hormone thing. Um, I can't remember if it's like auxins or cytokinins or something. There's something uh, in the plant that is high. And it, I'm pretty sure it comes from kelp and other things. But Yeah, I've seen it a few times myself. Pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, I definitely think that's pretty cool. Um, I, I don't know what causes it. I think there might be even multiple causes for it. But uh Sometimes plants, uh, they differentiate their tissues in a way that you don't expect. Um, uh, and I think I used to know a, a phrase for this, like phylody or something like that. Not virusense or anything, but like yes, that kind of stuff. Bud. Is, leaf bud. Yeah, is leaf phrase. bud. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Honestly, I've seen that associated uh, with kelp before too. Really? Now there may be PGRs. I also Wonder. think there could be a slight genetic component. Some of uh, Subcool stuff I know had like leaves that would grow out of that spot and sometimes yep. a bud yeah. would form in that same thing. I had what I called my yep. middle finger pheno of Chernobyl. It literally looked like that. Like all the other uh, leaves are facing that way. And then one was just like, fuck you. Like, yep. It felt so that. Subcool. And I've yeah, had one of those I agree. It could be a genetic thing on some strains too or some particular plants. I think it's so neat. Um, 
you know, I, I think I said it already in the past, and I think some people have even commented that this is actually already happening if you have the dank. But, um, you know, I'm excited for like, you know, maybe even little mutations like these becoming like another bud site that could be like more product for the person who's cultivating or like even say- le- leaves that are full of trichomes, um, you know, just fan leaves. Like if fan leaves could have cannabinoid content, I mean, they do. So, I mean, shit, like, yeah, massive, so but like, hash washers, but like, man. It's I, of course, hash I, mean, yield. <laughs> I mean, like at the level of like flower, though, in, like in not, general. Some yeah. strains tend to like Blue Dream. It's, in my opinion, its fan leaf is as trichomous as its buds, which is like a reason I think that it makes good hash. But not every plant is like that, obviously. Uh, some people right. call it like the sugar leaf, and it depends on how much you remove throughout the process. Because if you remove a bunch of your fan leaves, you end up with basically all sugar leaf. So mm. everything you're trimming off is pretty high trichome. But it just yeah. it's a cultivation technique thing there. Yeah, if you could like if if you we could get to a point where we could breed the plant to have like, I mean, instead of having like 20% or Maybe that's even sort of a, a, a large amount, like 10% or 15% or even more of the, the harvest, just of the biomass straight going to cannabinoid and terpene content and other compounds for that matter, esters and all that. Um, I think that'd be really useful for the home grower and also a commercial level win-win. It's definitely interesting. I'm, I'm hearing more and more about the stuff being grown in tanks nowadays. Um, that seems to be the way that like the, I thought that it wouldn't be able to scale, but I guess they're getting better and better returns on these things and they're getting, you know, better with the technology. Like I'm talking for those who don't know, you can make like THC by, you know, growing it in yeast or some other Mm. modified thing in a vat. And uh, like Brandon's even doing over with his microbes, like there's certain uh, concoctions that they're engineering microbes to break down certain things and make proteins or whatever, uh, you know, enzymes. There's lots of crazy, uh, chemistry that I'm definitely not savvy enough to discuss at deep length, but it's kind of interesting and exciting to see those people pushing it forward. But at the same time, I'd rather, um, like Matthew was talking about, maybe try and breed a cannabis plant that can produce such a high volume that you would just want to grow it at scale on a farm under the sunshine and then have people that can go plant it and harvest it and enjoy it and uh, not just have it be a factory full of bats. It just seems more, uh, I don't know maybe i'm a hippie or naturalistic but i like the idea of fields full of plants versus like a you know industrial warehouse full of vats but both can probably produce the same amount of end product given uh the right amount of time and research so this reminds me of a self-criticism i have about uh you know like when i go to order like uh, soups and things at like a restaurant and um you know the you, sometimes i have this like fantasy that the um you know that there's some sort of like culinary alchemist who's like got this big pot and that's not always not the case but like certainly (laughs) you know somebody who's like mixing it all the time and like always like adding seasons to it just having this like soup that's uh being kept and um you know that's not always how it how it goes you know sometimes it's a little bit less of an involved uh process and sometimes it's a less less of a like i guess i would say like a rustic process like there's a there's an idea about what's going on and then there's the reality of like culinary entrepreneurship, I suppose. And that um, doesn't make it bad. It just doesn't like match our, our traditional, you know, like, like when I think of a farm, I think of a red barn and an open field, but um, of course that is not most farms. Right. You're right. Yeah, no, it's changed a lot. I want to ask Spartan uh, after he takes that sip, because I saw I just took a big buff over there. What he's soaking on tonight. Oh man. I was just smoking on some durian from Yeti Stash. My buddy Yeti Stash killing it with this. It's all rosin, and um, it smells absolutely disgusting. Like, I can't stand the smell at all. Like durian fruit? Have you ever smelled durian fruit? I've seen videos of people, like, vomiting and smelling that. I've never actually smelled one. That makes sense, because, yes, (laughs) that's what that fucking smells like, man. It smells terrible. Durian is pretty bad. But there's a sweetness that... There is a weird sweetness in there, but I don't know. I love smoking it, though. I love smoking it. I just put a big old, big old, I don't know. I don't weigh it. I just stuck a bunch in that my little Dr. <laughs> Dabber there. That's the way to go. And I don't know. I got a good fucking 10 or so rips off of it, so I'm pretty happy now. Donnie Burger is in that wheelhouse of just, like, it might smell a little bit foul, but it smokes amazing. So it's just, like, 
I actually like how that one smells. It's not like super, super offensive, but it's got a little bit of that kind of funky, like what the fuck is this kind of stink to it. So it's the high of Donnie burger that I like. It's like a good potent high for me. Everybody I've given it to uh, just gets so ripped. It's like super, super fucking potent. So I'm a huge fan. I literally went and bought my buddy grew it and I could have gotten his cut, but I was like, you know what? I want to, you know, hunt a pack and find some myself. And uh, it's just, I haven't seen bad, bad Donnie burger. In fact, it won like some cannabis cup here in San Diego, highest cannabinoids, highest terpenes and highest overall, like combination of cannabinoids and terpenes and uh, just beautiful flower. Um, so has got a pack of it. I told him, I said, why don't you fucking hunt you that fucker? <laughs> well, we yeah, got Don- he does. Yeah. Eventually. We got Donnie at, uh, at work. So it would, I told him it'd be cool to run through his pack and then we can find, we can run it up against what we got. You know what I mean? And have, I think it's cooler if we could have, if we have the, uh, if, if we find the cut instead of just getting a cut, you know what I mean? If, if I ever visit Mitten Canico, the uh, Donnie Burger Room is going to be the first one that I'd go to get hit by a wall of that. Just stank. Be amazing for sure. Uh, I want to pass it over to Kyle for a little bit because uh, he's been quiet over there. What are you smoking on tonight? Do you got anything, uh, you know, exciting or new coming up? I know you just had a big drop. Yeah. Uh, so I've, t- I've still, I've been hanging on to this, uh, Black leaf Putnam Afghani that I have. It's kind of it's a uh, just really authentic, and so I kind of dabble in that. And it's just really like uh, traditional, like from when I was like sixteen. Uh, effects just more like a mellow, smooth, uh, versus kind of like I'm, I don't know. I'm not really into. I'm not. I don't really pair well with the varieties that are a lot of the varieties, not all uh, that are going around nowadays. But um, yeah. So some cool things that that is happening. That I'm like wicked excited about. Um, somebody that. I respect a lot, and I know there's been some uh, different opinions about this certain person. So I'm just not going to name names, but uh, so I got a cut of NL5 um, sent to me, and I'm not sure if that's the original yet. I haven't really asked him about it, but it's definitely NL number five. Uh, but more importantly, I'm getting a 40 year old purple Urkel clone uh, that got sent to me, and uh, I have them in my uh, my room now. They're they were a little beat up from the, the mail, but uh, they're they're in like I put them in my uh, my clone dome, and they're just kind of like you know acclimating them slowly. You better dunk but, uh, those things in sulfur a few times. Dunk them in some soft oil lax. I would be, I would keep those things. Yeah, they're super like, isolated. No joke, right dog. Now. Hey, I am dead serious, bro. Like you have to treat those things like they have russets. Because if it's from who I think they're from, you got fucking Russet Mike now. Yeah, so so ironically, I was going to treat – well, I treat everything now anyways because of the last time that I got powdery mildew from somebody that I thought was, like, a really close friend that I thought I trusted. Well, I got PM from him. but uh, uh, So I knew I was going to treat them. But then in the chat, you had mentioned something like that. I was like, wow, well, I guess I should definitely uh, – so they haven't been anywhere near my, my mom's at all. They're in a separate room by themselves in a dome. So I do know when I go to put them in solos to start acclimating in soil, uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to make, like, a legitimate – lobster pot of sulfur water and fully submerge and uh not only that but but i would just treat them with like an sop where you're doing a foiler spray at least every three days minimum for like a good for a good like five six weeks matthew i'm curious your thoughts on that matter because um I know yeah, that I like you, to hear some feedback from Matt on how he feels. The, the is best five approach. or six weeks overkill, or how how long would you go about trying to treat it? And uh, what do you feel about Brandon's uh, rotation of IPM? I think that um, hyper vigilance is really important. I think that um, it's not about trusting people because even within the, even even from transport, something could, weird could happen, or uh, you you know you just never know. Um, I think Mm -hmm. I've definitely seen people's friendships become strained. Certainly I've experienced it, uh, as on both sides and as a mediator, um, for exactly this kind of question for a quarantine, I definitely agree with it, with being, um, with, with at least two, maybe four weeks would be ideal, but not everyone can do this. Um, because a lot of, a lot of pests, especially in, of course, this is in the context of like a place where it's, it's warmer. Um, or if you have some sort of like room, at least room temperature environment, because the life cycle of various insects and mites and even pathogens 
um, are going to like present usually uh, within that time span. And during that time span, you know, you I always have two kinds of opinions. You could wait and not treat and see if you see something and then treat it because that way you'd at least have some data. Um, and, and you'd, first of all, you'd know if the stuff that you got was actually, you should look at it regardless, but if you wait, don't treat it and you can see something happens, even though you, you looked at it and you didn't find anything, um, that can also be humbling that your scouting protocol maybe was uh, deficient in some way or that for whatever reason, something happened. That's always useful. And then you know where those plants came from. On the I other foot. I got a question, Matt, not to interrupt you, sorry, um, but just if you can maybe integrate it into your answer is, so russet mites aren't that prevalent up here in New England. Uh, there's like two spotted spider mites and stuff like that, which I've had those too, because uh, I took a clone from a guy outside, but um, primarily maybe just for other listeners, because I've done some research myself, um, but and me as well, like uh, where are they primarily laying their eggs? And is, I mean, are, do they have any uh, involvement in the soils and mainly just under leaves or like what are what's their primary uh so <clears throat> what you'll see is with hemp russet mite everywhere they'll be in the nooks and cranny of the leaf vein so that a lot of times you'll see them on the they'll be on the underside of the leaves but they'll be like in those like really deep areas of the leaf where it contours inwards because these things are really, really small. I mean, these things are tiny, tiny, right? So, and then also you're, you'll see them on a lot of the newer growth sites, typically further down on the plant, but not always, not always, but usually they're in, they're going to be in the new growth, but also this is the thing too. I've seen them where they're not even on the, auxiliary or on the ancillary or the uh the secondary sites um but you'll see them just colonizing a, a, a part of the stem and you and it'll look almost just like a discolored brown almost like a fungus and then if you get in there and you're looking at it with enough magnification you can see what it is but if you can see it visually like and it's it looks like them, a fungus, yeah they it's like there there's a lot going on already Right. Say, do they lay their eggs inside the plant? I heard that. I don't know if it was so, a rumor yeah. or not. Anyways, yeah. to answer the question, no, they yeah. don't. Okay, they do good. Not. <laughs> so, um, so hemp russet mites, like broad mites, when they feed on the plant, uh, their saliva contains proteins uh, that really mess up the plant growth and the immune system. Um, which is why, like Brandon said, they like to be in like the like those like veins. Um, and then they also like to be in those like crinkled, corrugated, like the result of their feeding causes this like, you know, corrugated, gnarled um, growth. And, and different plants will have different reactions to this, which is great for them because it's a shelter. And it also kind of acts like what we call a pseudogall, which might even help them feed better uh, and make it easier for them to feed not only from predation, but also like it actually has a physiological like, facilitation of their feeding. Um, but right. So like to answer your question, you can find them oftentimes like on the underside of the leaves, on the top sides of the leaves, also on the petioles, also on branches as well. And in the flower for that matter. Uh, but I don't, but yeah, there is a pretty common, uh, I'm going to call it a myth because I don't think there's anything that actually substantiates this. If them actually, uh, laying the eggs in the seed itself, because well, for one, they would have to like bore into the seed and that would uh, sort of neutralize the seed itself because um, of that hole, you know? Uh, and they're actually, they have a stylet. They're not, they're not really great at boring into the plant, uh, into that like hard material. Um, they're really quite adapted to feeding on soft tissue. Did that answer your question in full? I liked it. Yeah. I appreciate that a lot. I wanted to uh, give Dr. MJ, a chance to uh, jump in and ask if he has anything that he wants to share because he's only got about 10 minutes before he's got to jump out of here and um, just give a little update and see how you're doing over there. Hey, yeah. Well, I was thinking about what I was smoking, um, but thanks for getting over to me. I do have to get going soon. Um, 
But I was smoking on some some red diesel that I grew last year in our New Year's Grow Challenge, and it was making me think that I should tell everybody to sign up for this year's New Year's Grow Challenge. We're meeting this week to finalize our teams and our groups and everything, um, but it's always a lot of fun. It's our biggest challenge of the year, so I hope you guys all come over to that. Um, but yeah, I got some family commitments. I got to go visit my mom. She had surgery uh, about a week and a half ago, so I am... Uh, heading off shortly to do that godspeed on mom's recovery yeah it's one of the reasons that, that we moved a bit closer to them so i'm happy to to be able to do that pop in much more easily and, and visit them um she's been going through kind of a, a rough stretch of health issues so it's nice to be able to be down here um but yeah, I don't know what else. I'm growing plants I'm really excited about that are doing well. And, and that's always fun. It was, had been a while. So I've got my my little garden up and running. Um, I'm working on a, a cool new part test video right now with the Photon Tech SQ 300 watt Pro. I'm actually doing a PAR and an EPAR test. So I have the new uh, Apogee SQ 610 sensor um it's based on really recent science by bugby and others that are looking at the the photosynthetic effects of uh light from 700 to 750 nanometers um so i'm diving all into that and it's going to be fun sort of exploration and doing both par and epar tests and comparing them um so that's fun i wanted to ask uh, what it was like for you now that you're in a new spot uh getting set up with a grow in a new place did you try and transfer all your old stuff and say like i'm going to grow in the same size tent or do you have more space now and maybe you're setting up a little bit differently well originally i was thinking i had more space now and so i was going to set up a bigger grow but like i don't know moving and settling into a new place is a little bit hectic so i i uh, sort of downsized went back to um just a four by two grow for this for this run i am thinking i'll have sort of my wits about me to do a much bigger grow i got some big lights that i want to sort of actually grow with so um i'm i'm, I'm thinking for the new year's grow challenge i'm going to set up maybe a five by five uh i still think it's going to be easiest i've thought about sort of building out space in my garage but that's like a bigger project so I have room in my office area um, to put a five by five tent and it's nice, you know, climate here is pretty easy for growing. I'm not too far from where Jack and Matthew live now. Um, I mean, the climate's not really that different from where I was. It's a little bit probably better um, in terms of not getting too hot. I, I, I actually am a little bit worried that my fan doesn't run enough because like um, it's on the, the temperature and humidity controller um, but it's almost always like perfect in there. It doesn't get too hot in the tent. It does. It's like perfect humidity and the fans just not running at all. And of course, the, the thing it's not sensing is CO2, which isn't an issue at this point. The little plants still have plenty of, of carbon dioxide. But um, I, know, I was thinking about that. You know, if you have your fan controlling just for temperature and humidity, if it never goes off, there are other things it's doing, too. Put a mushroom bag or a pet hamster in there. You'd be good. I think they'll be pr producing enough humidity by the time they need that extra carbon dioxide that the fan's going to be running periodically anyway. So it shouldn't be an issue. I think we uh, uh, typically underestimate the human provided CO2 even in a space, unless you're uh, very diligent about your exhaust fans in your home. It's easy for CO2 to get to have much higher levels than you might realize if you don't have a sensor. Yeah, assuming that the grow tent is actually exchanging air with the room. See, like the tent's all sealed up and that exhaust fan only kicks on when the, the humidity gets too high or the temperature gets too high. And it just doesn't because like <laughs> the office isn't that warm and the humidity is perfect. And I mean, I don't know, when the plants get bigger and they start producing more humidity, that, that thing will kick off. But like, it'll go the whole day without cycling right now. So they're just sitting in a sealed tent. You know what I mean? So San Diego, weather too good? Question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's got me thinking about maybe an additional like setting on the fan controller. Like it has to yeah. run for five minutes every hour, like, regardless. 
yeah, timer kind of thing. Yeah, just in addition to all that, like if it's not kicking on for any other reason, it's got to run on low setting for a few minutes every hour just to like exchange the, the air in that space. That's mine just run basically just to move the air around because the temperature and humidity are so close to where ideally I want it. Like I can just finally adjust that knob or whatever uh, if it's a little high or a little low, but yeah, San Diego weather is very conducive for growing, uh, especially indoors. So, well, it's uh, a it, if you run it constantly, that would drop my humidity down in the grow space. Not that bad now. It's been it's been wetter here, but the right now they sort of need to hold on to a little bit of their own humidity, or I'd have to supplement it. But sure. yeah, it's fun, man. I mean, I don't know. It's a cool climate. I, I always have sympathy for people that are growing in, in places that's like, you know, 100 degrees with 70% humidity or something. And they're like in a swamp. Um, there's some really tough sort of growing conditions to have to deal with. Um, but yeah, this isn't one of them. It's like Florida. Shout out to, I think, Big Pone moved from Florida up to uh, Michigan. And uh, yeah, hot and humid is tough because you're using AC that's expensive dehumidification yep. so uh, granted the ac does a little bit of dehumidification it's not all of the work to take care of like a florida i'd rather be if i was in a hot area somewhere dry kind of like vegas where you're just mainly worried about just bringing the uh, temperature down then you're actually having to supplement but i guess yeah but you compare that to like me and I'm, i don't have ac or dehumidification or a humidifier and i'm worried that my exhaust fan isn't running enough like you know i mean think about the energy output it, between those different grows and just the the expense in setting up the equipment i mean you you do have to sort of be prepared for the equipment there for the climate that you have to manage but fortunately we have a pretty easy one yeah i see some people loop their veg back and forth to their flower tent and uh that can yeah, i think they exhaust their flower tent into the veg space um so that way the humidity basically builds in the veg space a little bit higher where it's more safe and uh, that can help some people out depending on what their setup's like. But I don't want to keep you too long. I said you had only about 10 minutes left. So I want to let you get your final thoughts and shout outs before I pass it to Kyle, who's going to be leaving here shortly as well. And we'll be adding some uh, potentially people from the chat. I sent the link and pinned it. So we might be having some uh, of our fellow growers join us. Cool. Well, I am sorry that I'll miss that. Um, have fun to whoever's going to jump in the show and, and take our places here. Um, I trust that we're, we're in good hands. Um, yeah, it's been fun. I'm glad I got to be back. I'll try to stay for the full show next week. Um, reminder to get everybody signed up for the New Year's Grow Challenge. We have a bunch of cool prizes. It's really meant for growers of all different skill levels. You don't have to be any kind of expert. Like we just announced our prizes for the Plant Training Grow Challenge. And they're for things like best journal and best grow me and best recovery and stuff like that. So come and grow together with us. And uh, yeah, grow or love everybody. Good luck to the rest of the show. Good luck to the panel and grow or love to everybody that comes in and joins us in the chat room. Thanks as always, Doc. It was great to have you back. Although uh, we didn't get you in the conversation too, too much till the very end there, uh, but always thankful to have you uh, no matter what. So thanks again. For oh, no us. worries. It's interesting stuff. I really enjoyed Spartan's um, sort of rundown and um, it would be remiss for me to cut out of here without sort of giving him another shout out for, for you know, fighting the f good fight and putting your your you know shoe leather where your mouth is and getting down there and sort of really um making making your place making your laws potentially a little bit better for for growers in the growing community that's definitely worth taking our hats off so um i did not mind sort of just sitting back and listening to all of that and grow love everyone i will see you guys next week peace out doc have a good night thank yeah. you so much for coming uh kyle breeder uh, you're next up. It said that you've got to get going here soon as well. So I wanted to give you a chance to give a final thoughts and shout out before I let Narwhal UP from Michigan, uh, the Uper in here. Nice. Well, I'm, uh, I'm happy whoever that is. I'm sure they're probably excited to be a part of it, especially if they've been following for a while. Um, but, uh, yeah. So Kyle Breeder, uh, if you're looking for feminine seeds, that's what I, that's what I do. Um, I have a website, the letter P followed by the word breeding.com. And uh, I have some new uh, new seeds on there, which are uh, a collaboration between me and John from Green Bodhi, which uh, people have been eating them up like candy, Halloween candies. Um, but yeah, so just uh, I'm going to the Harvest Cup for anybody that wants to go or knows where it is in Worcester, Massachusetts at the DCU Center. And yeah, I'm just glad we're, uh, we're still doing this. And 
um, you know, that people still listen to us and that we're helping people. And that's, uh, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in live life by whatever you put into the universe, uh, it comes back. So I think we're doing a good thing here. And uh, yeah, I'm just happy to see you guys. You guys are all still well and we do this and I'll see you guys next Sunday. Peace out, Kyle. Good to Thanks see you. Thanks again for man. joining us. Thanks, guys. Bye. I believe in the whole karma thing, too. If you uh, put good out there, it comes back around. Whether it's logical or spiritual, spiritual, I think good people do good things for each other. And uh, there's no honor among thieves. So, you know, hanging around good folks and doing good for each other, I think, comes back around to you more often than you know. For sure, man. Have a good night, Kyle. Yeah, thank you so much to Kyle. And uh, check him out at peabreeding.com. He's still got some seeds left on that new drop. Uh, Green Bodie, like I've said in the past, I worked at a medical delivery and some of his flower was some of the most popular stuff on uh, our menu. So it was good medicine for a lot of people. Chances are it might be great medicine for you as well. Kyle has done some great breeding work with it. So I'm excited to see some people grow out those plants uh, here very soon. So exciting stuff for sure. We lost Narwhal. I think I waited too long to add him. So Narwhal, if you want to jump back in, or maybe I actually hit like decline instead of accept, but uh, I do apologize for that. We also had somebody else I typed in the chat, um, but they had like a regular... Uh, I'll call it a government name, so I don't want to expose your true identity. I wrote the first name and last initial. Um, it was a Dustin M, which I don't find sharing that much information. So Dustin M, if you can at Cheap Home Grow or at G Jack Greenstock and let us know who you are in the chat, I'd be more likely to uh, have you join the panel. Yeah, we got to make sure you want to be on too, because some people just click that up there and don't really know what they're clicking and they don't really want to be shown. <laughs> showing their faces or whatever yeah exactly it's a live show too as a reminder for those who don't know we are actually live this is not like uh, pre-recorded and then uh, streamed and then we like chill in the live chat this is like actually live we can see you uh thunder dan saying garden club garden gang uh okie grower who picked up a pack of the hindu root beer cheers to you okie grower thank you for supporting kyle that's awesome of you great sun grown 207 i don't spend much time on there after the new kind Keep it going. I'm not sure what that's in reference to. I probably missed something earlier, but always cool to see the live chat going. It's tough to keep up with sometimes, but I know a lot of my other panel members are very good about that. So it's cool to see a lot of people, Aldridge 25, cracking his typical inappropriate jokes, but we still love you, Aldi, <laughs> even though uh, you get a kick out of the sick sense of humor sometimes. And I, I also relate to that. So I, I can appreciate it. Although I won't repeat some of the things that are written. Um, but yeah, she paint splatter arts yo 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 i see you um but anybody who would like to join that zoom link right there uh that's pinned by cheap home grow will bring you right on into our chat so if you want to show us your garden if you want to ask questions or if you just want to chill and listen we're going to be here for the next you know 45 minutes or so we'll be here till the six o'clock hour i did forget to mention earlier we did have a time change today fall back i don't know about you guys but i always get fucked up by the time change i think uh <laughs> that's the next thing we need to petition our to do is stop doing the damn time change I agree, uh, man. arizona's figured it out yeah. my wife she's like we never had a time change what the hell is this like and in ohio and california we've got it both ways so it's a uh, inconvenient for sure i don't mind so much i've anymore. never minded it myself but yeah. uh i suppose we could live without it i had a whole extra hour today it seemed like so i was okay with it today <laughs> And I'm not okay with it when I don't have an hour, see. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't feel strongly about it. I think it's mostly agricultural, right, at this point? It, yeah, it doesn't it's originally actually, from that. Right. It doesn't actually change the amount of sunlight hours. People could just change the start times of things if they really wanted to, right? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. I know that in China, um, there is no demarcation. But uh, so like, so like in uh, the very West, you know, in uh, the contested places, let's put it that way, uh, versus like the East Coast, you know, it, those are very massively different places on the earth, but uh, they don't, they don't have a time demarcation change or anything like that. So the, I, guess I guess that's I, not quite the same thing, though. I, I guess I'll say maybe I'm less pro fuck the time change now that I know China is like uh, also, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to be. Yeah, you don't want to be red, right? No, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> messing around. And there's some great people in China, but the party, Chinese Communist Party, can be quite problematic. We do have Hutch 
who uh, sent photos earlier. I'm going to add Hutch to the call because they're a grower. I got DMs from them. I have faith in you, Hutch, that uh, you're keep connecting. your finger on the button. No. But um, I got I got that finger on the button. We have to I'm keep ready. track of uh, time zones in America, too. So we, ha- we already uh, have uh, mathematical skills. Pacific time, Eastern time, Mountain time. There's one more, Central. Yep. Yeah. Somehow so, Ohio is Eastern time, even though it's like <laughs> very much yeah, Midwestern like when, state. When they call Michigan like East Coast weeds, I'm like, you guys ain't no East Coast, but like a lot of people call <laughs> Michigan East Coast. For the fresh coast, man. We got the fresh water. There you go. That's true. Yeah. I like that. That's what I would push if I was a Michiganian. Just not that Flint water, though. The, the water from the lake. <laughs> You're damn right. <laughs> not, that's not the only one. There's more cities now popping oh, up. Oh, man. It's just so bad. I feel for all that, all that shit that went down there. Well, I will say uh, Hutch has officially joined the call. So, Hutch, if you want to unmute yourself, I did mute you uh, when you came in. Just as a reminder, if you've got the show playing in the background, to mute the show. Uh, so that way we don't hear the echo or anything like that. But welcome, Hutch. Uh, how you doing? Uh, good. Good. Thank you. Good to have you. Uh, if you are you comfortable sharing where you're tuning in from, or do you have uh, questions about the garden? A- any updates that you'd like to share? Uh, I can I can share where I'm turning turning in from. Um, uh, I live in New Zealand. If you know who that is, oh, that's a far way. You're a, ki- a kiwi. We would call you here at least. Well, I don't know. Would. That's the Americans are really bad at geopolitics. If we no, haven't love, conquered the place, then we don't know anything about it. Oh, I'd like love that New way. Zealand, man. I love New Zealand, man. That's where the hobbits are from, man. That's where they shot all the hobbits. <laughs> <laughs> the that that nice. state of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I I'll tell you what, what so I know that New Zealand is the closest country to the to Antarctica, I think, and that they have a huge population of sheep. I think there's more sheep than there are humans there. <laughs> That's what I've heard. And yeah. I also and I also think that gun control, they're not a big fans of guns there. Like uh, I guess, like there's there's right. a few citizens, like if you're like have a farm or something, you're able to have a gun, I think, but that's it. I looked into moving no, it, man. Any, anyone can own a gun here. If, really? If, yep. Okay. If I might, you're 18, is Australia is different than New Zealand. Get our license. That's I was crazy. looking into New Zealand, man, because I really liked the place. It really looked awesome. I was actually looking like if I was going to go anywhere else, New Zealand would be where I want to go. That's Just Lord a short 22-hour right? flight across the world. No big. <laughs> That's perfect. Hey, exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah. That's exactly what I want. <laughs> I want to be as far away I'm, from everything. Unfortunately, our legalization vote failed by 70,000 votes last year. It's only a matter of time. Oh uh, Out of the- 2 million. <laughs> Is there a, a strain from, from there that's uh, notable? I, I think it might be Australia, the Mullumbimby Madness, but maybe that's uh, the Kiwis. I can't remember. I know it's down down under somewhere. We that's Australia. Have, yeah, we have a lot of old strains here, but like 80s, 90s strains. What are you token on tonight, and uh, what's popular around where you're at? Um, I'm... Smoking some unnamed native weed. <laughs> Growing by mates. Yo, I that's, that's the good shit right there, dude. I know it. Yeah, well. You're supposed to make yeah, up a I'll, cool I'll name. I'll give you a little bio of me, eh? Um, so I'm a bit like the American one. I've been growing indoors for about 30 odd years. <laughs> outdoors for two years before that <laughs> and I think what 90, 97 I got a pack of seeds from Sensei Seeds it was called the Cup Cup Winners Mix or something okay yeah <clears throat> some and super up, silver haze in there for sure I think there's like bubble gum white widow AKA 47, maybe. Mm-hmm. I've pretty much been growing them for since then. <laughs> I grew that ice. That ice was really good. And uh, this year, I actually kind of took the plunge and then 
ordered a couple seeds. Uh, a Killer Queen and a Polo 11. I think they were. Good choices. Speaking of Killer Queen, I know we've got another uh, weed nerd in here. Miranda Family Farms just joined us. Do you have any thoughts on the uh, Killer Queen or Apollo 11? Um, yeah, they're all they're all good strains. I did an event yesterday. I was vending. And I just wanted to show you guys. I got a cool t-shirt. It's like Tyrone Biggums. <laughs> Shout out to Chappelle. I love Dave Chappelle. He's hilarious. Oh, yeah. But uh, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to give you a quick short uh, tour of the garden just because I never get to show it because I'm always uh, not here. So. No worries. I got you spotlighted now, and uh, it's cool to see some of the herbs nows over there uh, cranking it out. Nope. This is my bunch of my junk. Oh, shit. Turp Town Throwdown. Congrats. Big roots. For all you guys that want to see how I do, that was me back in the day. <laughs> Anyways, here we go. Veterans Day is coming up, I think, right? So uh, thank you yep, for your service. That's correct. Yeah, this, uh, these plants, I don't know if they're coming in furry. And, oh, there you go. There you uh, go. These, yeah, yeah. these just got into flower, uh, this row right here. Like you can see, they're just starting to make little hair chunks. But uh, I don't even know what the hell we've got here. Camberly, which is GMO crossed with uh, strawberries and cream from uh, Exotic. We got we got a mixture of shit here. Weed nerding. What yeah, uh, yeah. do you got? Any of Subcool's gear going, or any of your crosses with his gear? Ah, uh, yeah. So, getting around by, uh, all right. So, this there is the go. flower. Uh, this is, uh, Miss Jill has uh, Mendel Perps crossed with Jilly Bean. They're in testing. So, I got a row of that going right here. These things are, con I'm going to start harvest tomorrow. So, that's why they look like kind of like shit. Plus, I, uh, I lost power for a week and kind of, uh, that kind of mm. put a hurting on everything too. Uh, this is my, this is my two soups. This is, um, uh, so I took peanut butter and jelly and crossed it with a zinger because the peanut butter and jelly didn't have really any flavor to it. And the zinger has like a, a bog sour strawberry and it really came through on it. And it's so, so frosty. And I already stole a branch and put it in the, my herbs now and it tasted so good. Hey, but can you uh, yeah, flip your camera I'm, real I'm quick? excited. Can you take and flip your camera just to the side? We're only getting a small view right now. Hey, hopefully I'll switch it. No, there we go. There it is. Is that better? Boom. Yep, you're good now. Yeah, you can see I need to de-leaf this shit. So a lot dying better. leaves and shit on it, but is that purple one behind it? The same one? This is uh Cheraptera Kush, which is uh so Subcool had um Jack's Cleaner Blueberry Fino. Cairo uh, Kush, maybe? Yeah, something like that. I don't know how actually I asked Miss Jill, she doesn't even know how to pronounce it, which is kind of funny. Uh, that, but it's a Miss Jill strain. Like a fat it's um, right there. Jack's Cleaner 2 crossed with the, um, uh, the Blueberry Fino crossed with uh, the Purple Afghan Kush. I'll try to get around here because you can see this one's this Fino over here is way more purple. Damn, that one nice. dropped, right? But blah. Yeah, that one's nice and dark. This one's uh, Sweet Tea. We all know Sweet Tea. So cool. I don't know if I can zoom it good, though, and I get a get some frost action but these things are so freaking frosty so it's pretty much a, just a mix going on in here a lot of it's uh testing for me and testing for miss joe what's your favorite light in the rig it looks like you kind of, kind of a mixed uh setup over there or maybe so they're all I, the same they're all spider farmer except for i put a little shop light just to give me a little extra light over here because these are coming down and then, the, and then those are going to move over. But um, yeah, these are all spider farmer. Um, and then I have a spider farmer inline duck fan. So it goes back to what you guys were just talking about. So I have uh, like duck work that comes down and one there and one over right there. And that's sucking out of my flower room. And then it, uh, it comes through kind of goes <laughs> behind here. Hold on a minute. 
I love seeing the, the, uh, veg the pipes. And it pushes it right down into the fucking bedroom. And I, nice. my bedroom is just like a seedling starter right now. It's not full. I don't have much going on. I do have a, this is weed nerdish though. Hey man, your flower room's looking packed. So. That That's cool, dude. Yeah. I've saved I all mine that. as well. I, I love those yeah. cards, man. It's a collector's <laughs> thing for sure. But yeah, so the, I have a dehumidifier back there. So I, uh, I retired that shit years ago. I'll show you why. Get the underbelly under the skirt. You know, the girl um, would be happy. Shave legs. He loves that. <laughs> so right here, I have a uh, central AC. So my duct work right here, I just drilled a couple of holes. So I have like either ACE, the AC will come down in the uh, summertime. And that kind of gives me some coolness in here. And then I also have this thing, which is attached to um, to this one, which sucks out. And uh, I usually don't have it in here. I have it in, in this in this spot and it, uh, it it sucks it. You can actually see it. I got it coming all the way through. So this one sucks out. So I got air circulating. So it never gets uh, it never gets humid or, or hot in here because it's kind of just moving around with my central AC. Nice nice, man. What's the rig. what's the footprint on that like uh, room that we're looking at right now? Is it like twenty by twenty? Um, no, actually, I I don't know. I don't even know. <laughs> but yeah, it's probably around there. But this it's is a... this is this is just me, and it's it's a lot of work for me. I'm disabled, so this kind of sucks to have to harvest it. It's fun to smoke it, but <laughs> it's a good problem to have uh, that you got yeah. so much that it's becomes a task to harvest <laughs> that's pretty much what what i do and keep me out of trouble I, uh, it's, it's, it's different nowadays it's like it almost feels weird when i was doing this event the other day uh there's like cops walking around and it's just so weird to me because i'm like vending <laughs> that like selling flour and smoking it and shit and like uh and the cops are just walking by and I've, I've been arrested four times for this friggin' plant. So to be able to have a cop walk by and not care is like weird to me. It's so weird. It's got to feel cool similar them too. in New York too. I know. Uh, yeah, I know one. that feeling. Yeah. From what I'm hearing. Oh, hell no. My brother was on the run from this plant for 12 years and he lived in New Jersey and I'd go to New York a couple times a year. We just walk through there and smoke just like we did here. And no, there's yeah. so many people, they wouldn't know where it was coming from. That's true, I still true. don't like smoking if I see a cop. I mean, I don't care where I'm at. If I see a cop walk around, I probably hold the thing down next to me. <laughs> I still do yeah. that shit, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's reflex at this point, right? So, so this is this whole grow, I'd like to keep it simple. So I, I use, obviously, I use big roots, and uh, I uh, use a little bit of earthworm casting. So when I'm, I, I put them in seven-gallon pots. And as you can see, I have like room on the top, so I'll I'll give it a little top dressing and some worm castings. But like when I when I'm putting the um the so like the transplant and the plant into this pot, I'll uh put a little layer halfway down of uh like an inch worth of worm castings, and then because of the top dressing, all I have to do is just add water, and I don't have to add anything else ever. It's like super easy. So do you? I, but I I got fungus gnats because I bought soil from a store that I know had the fungus gnats, but I bought them anyway, just to help them out. Cause I know I can get rid of them. It's not a big issue. Yeah, they're easy to deal with. I was just about to yeah, ask but... in, in regards to like the uh, top soil area, have you ever tried using like a, a mulch or anything on top, like a straw or hay or well, anything like that? You know what I was, you know what I tried doing and it made a crust is, uh, I don't if I have it right here. Actually I do. Uh, right here, Mr. B's Green Trees. So uh, this isn't the stuff, but it's like the brand. I, I put a little on the top and it made like a crust. So it made it so the fungus gnats couldn't dig through it. You know what I mean? I hear you. I, I'm just saying um, one of the biggest improvements I saw when I was growing in soil was when I started to cover the top of the soil. And I think that'll help 
not only eliminate the fungus gnats because it just keeps a more consistent moisture airflow underneath there is great. You've got the legs cleaned up real well. So the airflow should be able to move around. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily the issue, but just uh, more even drying out and then also watering. It just seems to retain the water and soil a little bit better. Um, I, I've only seen positives from it. It could even be just like rice hulls, like a layer of rice hulls over the top of your soil. Some people don't like that, but uh, I've seen it work well for a lot of people. And I think Spartan uses hay or straw. I can never remember which one or even the difference, but um, I use cannabis stalks. I just chop off my sticks and stems and that becomes my straw. I did the fatal mistake this year of throw a bunch of like trim from my outdoor into the fire pit and I uh, fishbowled <laughs> my whole neighborhood. It was bad. It was so <laughs> thick of smoke. I was like, oh my God, I'm surprised the fire department didn't come. Oops. That's funny. I've seen people throw like, uh, I was talking a little before the show, I had a very small amount of uh, powdery mildew on my recent harvest. And I just got rid of like the entire uh, branch that it was connected to, not just like cutting out the pieces because my wife's really sensitive to it. So we just got rid of it. And there's plenty of uh, good stuff that wasn't infected. And I, I saw a video that had forgotten to write like, oh yeah, I'm getting rid of this because it's moldy or, or there's botrytis or whatever it was. But it's just them throwing a giant outdoor plant onto like what would be a normal size bonfire. And when the cannabis plant hit it, it was just like, it erupts into flame and just, it does let off tons of smoke and whether it's trim or leaves or an actual live plant, it's a uh, crazy to see when you do it that style in a fire. Yeah. I smoked it too. It was bad. But yeah. I got a, um, I got three machines ready to start filling tomorrow. Can't wait. It yeah, makes yeah. it a lot quicker to harvest. I, <laughs> before I went to my sister's wedding last week, I, irresponsibly uh you know waited to the very very last second to harvest my plant probably like a half an hour before i left for the airport and uh i was able to chop down my amyases in like less than half an hour it just chop 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 fill up those trays stack it pack it turn it on and left for vacation and came back and 95 percent of it was good so i'm definitely uh, satisfied with that process yeah, I was just showing my buddy this. This is kind of like some, this is a, such a my my office is a mess because I just brought everything in from the event last night. But look at this shit. This is crazy. This is a this is a thing to someone tried to market. It's a marijuana grow kit, and it's like a um like a almost like a shot glass with a um a skull imprinted in it with just a peat pellet in there. That's all it is. There's a peat pellet in there. It looks like a clone shipper, not a freaking girl. It is. To me. It's like really weird. And it's like a weed skeleton guy. <laughs> someone tried to, someone sold these by the millions. They made them. And uh, one of my grow store buddies, they ended up coming across like hundreds and hundreds of these things. And they were just giving them out. Ominous. I feel like it's, uh, well, I guess they just know how to target a demographic of counterculturalists, huh? <laughs> I'll say this, even if it gets people to fail their first time, hopefully of that hundred people who failed with that stupid thing, you know, 10% or 20% or 30% of them keep growing. And they're like, you know what, maybe this isn't the way I'll try it in a solo cup or a terracotta pot or a flower, you know, something more traditional that will actually offer them a bit of success. And then they get into growing. Cause uh, I still think we're at the point where there's just not enough people growing their own. Uh, we got to keep pushing more and more people. Uh, if you're a cannabis user and you're not growing your own yet, if you're physically capable of doing it, you've got the property and things like that. Um, this show is called the cheap home grow for a reason. There are plenty of ways to grow cannabis affordably now, and you don't need to spend thousands of dollars to do it. You can get started very, very cheaply and uh, have good success with that. Yeah. Yep. That's what I'm all about. Cause I deal with a lot of uh, new growers. So I like to try to keep it simple. Uh, they get, I think a lot of new growers, um, like research and on their own homework, take on like um, they mix up a soil soilist. They make they they make a big yeah. mess out of it. So Tao, I got this for you. I remember you saying that you wanted a rolling tray. Yeah, yeah, second. yeah. Cool. But um, I'm gonna hop off. So I I just wanted to give you guys a tour because no no one ever gets to see my shit. So. <laughs> hey man, thank you for showing us around and thank you again for your service because Veterans Day is coming up and all of our veterans thank deserve you. respect on every day, not just Veterans Day. Yes, that's true. Thanks. Yeah, well, thanks for taking us around, man. Appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, your plans look great, dude. Peace. Thanks. Always cool to have the uh, people come on from the chat and uh, much, much respect to you. That is for everybody who doesn't already know, Miranda Family Farms. You can find them on farms. social media. Check them out. Peace out, people. Peace and love. 
Hutch, uh, I didn't want to cut you off, but uh, Miranda Family Farms jumped in and showed us around a little bit. But I, I'd still love to hear a little bit more about your story. So you recently ordered some seeds. I don't remember if you said what breeder yeah. you got them from. And uh, uh, you started brothers, brothers Grim. They um, have a queen site five days away. The polo's probably a week and a half. From harvest? I, yeah, to harvest. Oh, how, they, how are you loving them? Uh, well, Ooh, that is not a star. Review. I told you, it's not his mates that grew it outside in the woods. That shit's the real deal. I told you. Yeah, we've been breeding for thirty years. Just, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna preface this with saying that I literally got two seeds, so one oh. Apollo Eleven and one Killer Queen. So one each. One of each. Yep. Uh. They both how did you go good. about? How did you grow <laughs> grow them out? Uh, I mothered the seeds, and I'm on like third or fourth set of clones, I think. Mothers are like close to six months old. Organic guy or a synthetic guy? Um, I don't really believe in those labels <laughs> yeah <laughs> to be to be completely like i go um i grow in cocoa well no i i grow in my own soil mix uh i use cocoa vermiculite uh, a little bit of earthworm castings there's some drips and and some dolomite in there i like to kind of preload my ca- my cocoa with the dolomite and the gypsum just for safety probably doesn't really do anything but it's a safety thing i've done for years that holds the ph too it keeps that stable so that's good yeah i was gonna say that too and if it ain't broke don't fix it shit if you're having success exactly yeah and you know vermiculite's cheaper here than gerolite so it's great shit I'm a big advocate for it. It's in the Michigan made mix. It's got, um, inevitably it provides, um, silica, silica to the plant and yeah. it's the water retention water. ability yeah. is amazing. It, I, I think it's a yeah. great part of a good soil mix, but it's not necessarily widely available for everybody or at cost, but it's cool that you got it at a good price. Yeah. And, and that's where I kind of vary from this practice that maybe you guys go because i grow um old school dutch ebb and flow like flood and drain uh high fertigation so they fed every hour uh, that's like dr mj i don't know if you he was on earlier but he does uh like five or six times a day high frequency fertigation and, and mostly pure cocoa and perlite but um that's it's probably the most similar to your setup. And we actually have no problems yeah. with any, I mean, Spartan grows synthetic at work, organic at home. And it's just sort of a label. I was kind of curious, well, more I, so like I, the medium that you're growing in and uh, things like that. Yeah. I actually make my own fertilizer. Like, and I say, like I get, I, I've used everything, Kana, Emerald, Emerald Harvest. I thought you were all, talking all new that. manure. What, what's the uh what's the process like though like what you just said you make your own fertilizer. Uh, fertilizer so i ran tomato houses for quite a few years when i was young and i don't know if you've heard of master blend it's like a generalized greenhouse kind of mix i've heard of that yeah yeah i kind of that's my base um i have a good source of organic cleated minerals and I, I kind of make it up from then. I, I use um, a different form of silica that you got that you guys don't use. I use a I'm trying to remember the term uh, domesticated. Yeah. So it's uh, um, it's quite, it's the silica they use use to make um, processor chips, but it's. Um, Inert, no pH changes, as available as potassium monosilicate. I use New Zealand mitochondria and trichoderma, which is a 
if I remember my horticulture, there was something about the New Zealand Twakaduma that makes it extremely active or extremely vigorous. I can't remember which one. Well, the horse that, conditions. Well, on top of that, isn't it important because if I'm remembering correctly, New Zealand and many other island places have very strict import export um, on biology. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I very, I, very, very true. Yeah, very I can't ridiculous. get any of the stuff you guys use, basically. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's what as I was alluding to. Bio, um, something like Power SI here, like a 500 mil bottle. Um, I don't know what that is in Freeman Freedom Units. Uh, like half a quart, I think. Freedom um, units. Mils. That's a half liter. I yeah, like that. Liter. Freedom units. We got freedom units in America. Yeah. Freedom units, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, That's cool. They, they, they cost. Stone units. <laughs> yeah. You're making the American just one that like little America more. Of power, yeah, yeah, that <laughs> bottle of power SI here costs the average weekly wage. Oh, damn. Rough. I know what we're smuggling Sorry. into New Zealand. I mean, um... <laughs> It's I not worth that it. Back. Uh, and that's By kind the of way, the same for you. Really. I don't know, man. Even a small INSA, bottle is too big for me to be smuggling that, man. I don't know. <laughs> Lots of things are expensive in New Zealand and Australia. That's for foreign things, at least. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. The Especially with that 500 mil bottle stuff, just put terrible images in my head with <laughs> Martin and Tao talking about smuggling it. I'm sorry. Now, is that, a, yeah. is that um, VAT tax or, or what? Uh, shipping. Um, availability tax that the the store puts on, basically. Mm, you know, mm. they import it. They're the only ones with the import license. They can charge what the bloody will want if if, uh, if you want to use it. That makes sense. Um, like I can't. There's several light brands I can't buy here. I can't buy a Spider Farm light. They were. I have to import it from China. I can't import it from a buy it anywhere else. Because certain companies have brought up the rights and and decided not to import them because they've got their own branded version of that straight from the mm. factory. Uh, there's see. lots of stuff like that that goes on here, but um, like for my first fifteen years of indoor growing, I literally just grew with one four hundred watt HPS and a fan, <laughs> and whatever uni student flat closet i had <laughs> and, and and it worked and it works yeah i put myself oh, yeah. through, through uni and, and partied like a maniac for five yeah. years that one I, year I gotta ask climbing. now what were cannabis prices like back when you were going through uni growing out of that closet let's say you pull yes. like i don't know a few pounds a year what what is a, a pound or even a few ounces going for over in kiwi land i good Indoor ounce here basically goes for four hundred dollars, which is two hundred dollars American. Two hundred for an ounce, so that works. Yeah, well too. that's not bad. That's, yeah, not too bad. That's still what, pretty. That's still too cheap. That's six hundred a pound, right? Here. <laughs> for really um, good shit, it had to be really good, but that's probably. I, I sold a pound of outdoor this year, like top quality, but I grow more indoor than I, 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 I'm one of those people. I don't like killing plants. I, I, I really hate killing plants. Like I let a male sit on my desk and die rather than actually physically kill it. <laughs> so nope, I, I, know I, I, I threw a couple plants in the, in the backyard this year and, and grew some outdoor accidentally got like two pound oops um, oops so the pound for 500 bucks damn because you know <laughs> yeah. yeah you made somebody happy yeah 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 i don't smoke it i just you know it was an accident <laughs> but uh, it does interest me what because the only kind of cannabis content that we can consume in New Zealand is, is from the North American kind of area. And the total difference, the differences between how you, you guys grow and, and, and how we grow here and the problems we have are, are 
quite miles apart. Like I think I mentioned in chat earlier, I don't run any IPM. Like none. I, I, I don't have like tap on wood. I don't have any, like for the last, I can't remember how many grows I've never had any piss problems. Oh, no, man, lucky, lucky man or, or it's well balanced. I want to give Spartan Growing a chance to uh, hop out here and uh, give us final thoughts and shout out before I follow up with the question. And it was fucking awesome. Just I didn't, the time flew by. I didn't realize it was that close, but uh, that's awesome to hear about uh, just growing in different situations. Man, you don't know how lucky you are in, in one aspect, but the other aspect, uh, if the government would get off your back, it would be fucking paradise, man. So, Man, I, I would only encourage you. Well, I don't know, man. In your situation, that's scary. It's scary to get out there and fucking try to lobby your government at that point and stick your neck out there because then it's going to get you. The, the problem is there's yeah. a large section in New Zealand population that literally lives off selling cannabis. Yeah. It's the only income. And they're going to rally against that forever. They're going to rally against it forever. Yeah. Well, that's too bad. Hopefully. Times will change as people, as, as the world changes around you. So we'll, there's still hope. There's still hope, man. Make opportunity for those people in the new markets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hopefully it'll erode away that uh, that uh, desire to keep everything kind of crab bucket. Well, once they see the money that it generates in other places, the, that's usually what gets things moving. The governments, that, that's one thing they understand is money. So if they can see that they're missing out on money somewhere, they'll definitely want to get in that game anyways i gotta go guys uh love everybody here love the chat it's an awesome show today i love these shows when we bring on people man that's my favorite so uh, i'm leaving here with a big smile growers love everybody have a good uh rest of your night i'm gonna be on michigan bros grow show here in a little bit and i'll see y'all there thanks again Spartan. Spartan. always a pleasure to have you every week sincerely it's uh great to have you man Hutch, uh, my question that I wanted to follow up with was, what's the state of concentrates like over there? I know when there's no regulated markets, things can get a little uh, sketchy, but there's also some really crafty ass people out there. So I'm, I'm curious, are there people making rosin yet or is it nah. still uh, most of uh, We're very old school, like joints, bongs, spots. I don't know if spots is a New Zealand thing. Yeah, it's Let's a New Zealand what, thing, what is craft. What is a spot? Uh, you get two knives hot. Oh, red hot, oh, hot knife hits. And then, yeah, yes. hot now. Yeah, we call them spots. Is it because you get spots on your fucking arms from the scars doing those hot knife hits? No, because it leaves a spot of resin on the stove side when you pick the piece of butter. Mm. Ah, I see. There we go. I now, are the, you, but... did you, um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Jack. But uh, did you did you inherit the Commonwealth uh, <laughs> tradition of like typically making spliffs or like uh, adding a lot of tobacco with your uh, cannabis or not so much? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, I do. Um, Is it American tobacco? Uh, my apologies. No, it's homegrown <laughs> tobacco. Oh, oh, that's oh. different. That's well, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. still bad for you, people. Don't get hey, hey, hey. game that it's not cancer. <laughs> living living so, like, is I, bad I said, for don't you. shame it earlier. So it's, <laughs> let him have this. Okay. <laughs> My view no, is true. living is bad for you, right? You know, you only true. live once and living's bad for you. You got tobacco, right. was used, tobacco was used by um, a lot of different indigenous people um, for medicinal uses mm-hmm. as well so it's not entirely bad but you know overconsumption of anything can be unhealthy yeah, you can it. drinking coke. it's great yeah. ipm right i mean you can grow it around the uh the guy from raw rock and roll i don't know his actual name the ceo over there he grows josh. tobacco or josh over around the outside of his other plants because it's kind of like a barrier uh to some pests it, it does repel although there are pests that do attack tobacco that's why it's very heavily sprayed with pesticide in america by many many companies so um it's not like a perfect plant but it is an interesting one um and like it produces a lot of nicotine and nicotine is an incredibly interesting drug both on how it impacts humans but also uh, pests so um matthew might be able to talk more about that it's actually kind of leads to a question i just have been mulling over um hmm. Matthew and, and everyone like 
I live in New Zealand. Our ecosystem is very active and fairly balanced. And like I say, I don't run IPM. I don't have any pest problems. But I have a very varied garden and ecosystem. And I'm wondering if if there's you've noticed any difference between in a city growing, growing in the wild in America and maybe growing somewhere where there's definite holes in the ecosystem, like lack of bees, that kind of stuff. Um, and I would say... And, oh. Yeah, and whether that's why I don't need to grow, I use IPM. I don't know. I'm tempted. As soon as you said that, I was tempted to live... Because the, when I think, because of an occupational hazard... I think of New Zealand and Australia and this sort of, these sort of places where um, uh, the government is incredibly, incredibly vigilant about things getting in and things getting out because the cane toads, like in uh, Arizona, like in Australia, um, and that kind of thing. And New Zealand's the same way as, my, as I understand it. You're so like biosecurity is high. Yeah, I, we're, I'm we're more tempted to say that's an influence. Oh, what did you say, Hatch? I'm sorry, I talked over you. Well, we spend more on biosecurity than we do on importation of drugs. There you go. That, uh, the, that's how important it is to us. I, yeah, I mean, that does, but that doesn't mean you can't have native organisms that would come and feed on your plants. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, if you're not seeing it, I mean, that's great. There's people in the U.S., for that matter, who have the, ex- who have the exact same experience. I'm liable to say that uh, you know, that's great. And it might not always be that way, but, um, I do tell people all the time at a commercial level at a home grow level, um, some places are just going to be always, you know, essentially ridden with organisms that want to feed on your plants. Uh, other is, places are going to be way less that way. Is New Zealand a pretty large agricultural Island? Cause I'm not super familiar with like what their main GDP comes from, but a lot of agriculture places like and horticulture. California, for example, not an island, but we're really, really, really strict on, um, like you were just talking about, they're looking more for like IPM stuff than they are for like drugs. Like when you cross through, they're looking for like, you know, are you bringing like corn or fruit or whatever? They're not Mm -hmm. as worried about, uh, you know, what else you're bringing necessarily. So at least the ag checkpoints always seem occupied where a lot of the other checkpoints might not always be occupied. I'll just say that from my personal experience, going back and forth from Arizona, um, they're very, very strict about what people bring in. And with even just the small chance of if you do bring in a foreign pest, they've seen how many times in other countries that become a giant catastrophe and uh, ecological issue. We yeah, had, so uh, many- Matthew, probably know about this. We had an um, uh, accident last year, two years ago, Varroa mite got into the country. And- oh, yeah nearly wrecked our whole um, Manuka honey production and, yeah, and, and it, a, in a month, matter of months, it, it just about destroyed the whole of our production. Until I had heard something top. about that, but I'd never heard about the extent and how quickly. That is rapid. That is amazing. Well, if you think about it, you cannot be more than 128 kilometers away from the coast in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense then. So seven degrees of separation really applies here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, for those who don't know, the varroa mite is a parasite that feeds on the, we always thought hemolymph, but in fact, it's the fat reserves of honeybees, actually. And um, they can also vector tons of diseases. Uh, I think deformed wing virus and other sorts of things. And uh, it's really bad. And um, honeybees are not so great for the native bees as well. They can outcompete nectar resources, but um, it still wow. makes for sad photos when you see the bees dying with little fucking mites crawling up their neck and sides. Yeah, it's you a, can't help but feel bad about that. I have it's to just agree. A, a gross a part of nature, and some of the cycles are beautiful, and some of them are not so beautiful, but are necessary. So uh, it, it's an interesting balance. Like Hutch mentioned, not having to use IPM. That's you know for grown for 30 years mostly outdoor or a lot of outdoor to not have to worry about applying a bunch of stuff a lot of the time it sort of indicates to me that there must be some natural balance of predators and prey so that you're not necessarily ever getting overwhelmed with anything. admittedly i do put tasty plants in my garden for for stuff like i plant marigolds and 
I grow tomatoes, chilies, peppers, all that kind of stuff. It's lots of easier vectors for them, maybe. I don't know. Well, do other plants get infested with bugs and just not yeah, the that's my question. Plants? No. <laughs> no, there's no bugs anywhere. Okay. Yeah, I, I, no, I think a, that... A, it's not that there's no bugs. There's a okay. good balance between predator and pre- pest, I think. So you right. don't get any overpopulation. I'm you have glad, a pretty open like, plot of land too. Are you pretty remote? Like there's not a lot of people around you and you've just got like a, I set up in this area and there's not like a bunch of trees or bushes or anything, or are you pretty tight packed with other things? I live on the average quarter acre plot in New Zealand. Um, okay. So it's not like gigantic, but uh, uh. yeah. Well, with that being said, it is about the uh, 555 hour here. There's only four of us. So I guess, uh, we, we can jibber-jabber for a little bit longer, but uh, we're coming up to that time where we're about to do our final thoughts and shout-outs. So I guess I'll, I'll pass it first to Hutch. Do you have any final thoughts for us this week? And then uh, a shout-out, if, if there's anywhere that we can find you on social media, um, where would that be for the people if they want to follow you? Um, I, I don't really do social media, to be honest. <laughs> hey, no, no problem with that. It's probably for the best. I'll, I'll try and get a video and jump on it. I'll show you guys my grow. One day I'll get a cam or something for you guys. Um, but thank you very much for having me on, and and it's great, great show. I appreciate all your um, knowledge. Um, I well, thanks, well, thanks for sharing your perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, great experience. Time. And honestly, uh, it it feels good to actually like when I see analytics and it says New Zealand, I'm like. Is anybody really fucking listening in New Zealand? And then when I hear somebody calling and talk to me and like say, like, yeah, I'm growing them from New Zealand. Like you're not just some, uh, you know, bot or something that YouTube's trying to make us keep on streaming for or something. You know, you're an actual real person out there no, that's uh, listening yeah. and New Zealand is real. We're not all hobbits. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, man, it's yeah. great having you. And thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing with us. And uh, we definitely look forward to having you back in the future. Whenever we do these, look out for the link. And uh, we'd be happy to see if you could show uh, I, I try to cool. catch you every day or every time you, you go. Um, it's what 3 time is it over here, there? So, uh, 3 p.m. on a Monday. Uh-huh. So. Wow. Living in the future. All right, Living man. Living in the future, yep. Have a great one. And yeah, I'll pass good it growing to everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Peace and love, man. And I'll pass it first to uh, Matthew Gates and let you your final thoughts and shout-outs before we get out of here. Yeah, from the legal situation uh, with uh, Mitten Canico and Spartan, to um, hearing about how people are growing in New Zealand. I thought that was a really cool and enriching experience. And I really enjoyed the chat. Chitter Bob asked some cool questions and I'm always happy to answer. Um, So uh, if you want to find my content about plant health, you can find me in three major places, sentinel.com, where you can contact me for professional uh, help. You can also contact me on Instagram at Sync Angel, Twitter at Sync Angel, and also my YouTube channel, Zenthanol. Well, so thank you so much for joining us again. We did hit on a couple IPM topics tonight, so it was very great to have you here and uh, for all the other topics as well. I always appreciate your input. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, last, we've got the American one, and I'm actually going to pass you a question real quick that you and I kind of bat back and forth real quick before we get out of here. How would you take a clone only to seed form? That's rough because if it's clone only... You'd have to pair it up with something first to be able to, well, you could ask, uh, you, you know, you ask one it. That's what I guess would be the best way is to, uh, you know, get the feminized spray, self it to itself, grow all those out, keep the original clone, try and find uh, something very similar. And then you could female, you could, you know, revert that if you wanted and use that as a uh, pollen, or you could look for a similar male, but that would be a whole nother story. And yeah, there's other say, ways would you go too. for a similar male or would you want to outcross it to something dissimilar, like uh, far away from it? So maybe you could tell the differences in the offspring. Yeah, I don't know. I, I never really attempted to do that. I thought about it. You could always go the old fashioned way, try and get uh, seeds that are very similar, cross it with itself, and then just search through those for a match like they did with the um, Cindy 99 and choose the right one to hit back to the original so yeah there's a couple ways but i don't know which way would be the best but i would bet the quickest would be this the reversal one uh 
yeah probably to find a um yeah you know i'm not really 100 percent sure to be honest yeah no i think that's but those a, are a couple of ways yeah that you I'm could go about we, it we're able to squeak that in at the very end uh we had a minute or two to, there to fill so i figured uh before you give your where the people can find you again uh might as well get the answer there so where can yeah. the people find you yeah uh the american one on the youtube like i say i've, I've always tried to add stuff those uh, i got a little bit on there but more Mostly on IG, uh, the American one, underscore with, underscore Akeens. And look for the little guy with the American top hat. And it's the American one. So don't forget the the, the, the whatever. Okay. <laughs> and like yeah, always Ohio good seeing University. everybody. It went really quick tonight, like Spartan was saying. A lot of interesting and diverse topics. And it's always great to get a, you know, someone from the outside giving their point of view. That was cool. I totally agree. And uh <laughs> Very thankful for everybody who joined, both the regular panelists and the new people that got to jump on. And um, with that said, uh, I guess my final thought on the whole uh, clone only to a seed, my question would be why? Um, do you really believe that you're going to improve it? Um, I think you're better off just trying to make it another cross. If you really have like an attachment to something and you want to keep it around, I'd go with the back cross approach, like maybe take something like let's say purple punch is a clone only, right? And then there's a bunch of purple punch crosses, like velvet punch is one of them. You could take velvet punch and then cross it to the purple punch. And then you get a back cross first generation. And I think that's gonna be close. And then you might find some stuff that's even a little bit better or nicer or different, but typically people really fall in love with that original clone only. So even if you think it's better, smells better, yields better, whatever, a lot of people are still going to ask, Hey, I want the purple punch or the purple Oracle or whatever it is. So it might be a, you know, uphill battle, but that being said, it's, doesn't necessarily mean that it's not worth doing. Uh, some of the hardest things in life are the most worth doing. So with that said, you can find me at Jack Greenstock right here. Um, if you'd like a copy of my book, 50 Strains of Green, you can go on 50strains.com and order one uh, international or here in the US. So uh, thank you for all who've done that. And um, if you also want to DM me, you could hit me up on Twitter, Jack underscore Greenstock, or email me directly, jackgreenstock47 at gmail.com. I really appreciate everybody. Uh, thank you for hanging in there with us because I know last week I, uh, you know, passed my host duties on to Matthew. He did an excellent job. I listened back and it was a great show, even without me and uh, Dr. MJ. But for Dr. MJ, Growers Love, and for Jack, this is Jack Greenstock signing out. Catch you all next week.